I'm Carmine Gallo speaking with Fred Dust, former partner and global managing director for the legendary design firm IDO. He's also author of the new book, Making Conversation. Hi, Fred. Hi, how are you doing, Carmine? I'm terrific. Congratulations. Great book. I love it. Oh, I really appreciate that. I mean, thanks for even reading it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, look, I'm always looking for new ideas in terms of uh, communication and leadership. And so many business books, frankly, are, are derivative. They don't teach me anything new. And so when I come across a book that looks at communication from a design perspective, that caught my interest. Well, thanks for reading it and, and catching your interest. That's really lovely. Yeah, I mean, I, I really do believe that at its fundamental roots, um, conversation is a creative act and we have to think about it that way. So um, I, I appreciate you, you, you acknowledging it. I'm curious because IDO is, and I'm pronouncing it right, IDO. Yeah. Yeah, IDO very well. was a, uh, it's obviously a, a admired design firm. It was an early leader in human centered design. They designed the first computer mouse for Apple. They designed the first notebook style computer. Uh, they've even redesigned our, the shopping carts that we use at the grocery store. And now That's IDO right. is involved in designing products for virtually every, every category from education to healthcare, why conversation? How does that fit in? Well, you know, I'm gonna give you a very simple, interesting moment that happened to me. Uh, just before he got fired, I was working with the then uh, former Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy um, in the White House. And he was like, the Trump hadn't fired him yet. And it was interesting, he was about to issue an epidemic of isolation and loneliness in America. Um, that was really looking at opioid, um, the opioid crisis, gun violence, things like that. And um, I was working with him designing the kinds of conversations he would have when he went out to do the town halls um, so they could be cathartic. And at that point, I sort of realized, wait a second, you can design a conversation just like you can design anything to kind of get the results that you want. And, and it, it felt to me like a useful construct for us to bring into um, to the work. So what I realized is that I've been designing conversations for decades, but hadn't really thought about it that way. And then once you use that frame, you unpack a whole new framework to think about how to have conversations, hard conversations. Really interesting. Storytelling is a theme throughout your book. You call stories, and I love this, you call stories illuminations. Can you explain <laughs> why you use that word? I use that word because I expect that a story should illuminate something about you that's very specific to you. It should, it should give me a little bit of a visual. Um, as you know, I like, a, I, I like visual language quite a bit. Um, I think that actually really helps us um, in many contexts. And I think the idea of an illumination is that a story should give me just a little bit of insight about you, Carmine. Like, what, what, who are you and, and why are you who you are? And so I will often ask people, even in job interviews, like, can you give me a 20 or 30 second story of who you are? Who were you when you were 12? What got you to where you are? You mentioned something very important. Give me okay. a 20 to 30 second story. Let's go through the four principles to telling a good story or a good illumination. And we'll get to that. Uh, mm -hmm. An illumination should be short. That's principle number one. Is that what you mean, Fred, yeah. by <laughs> keeping it to a, a reasonable amount of time? Yeah, I mean, let, let's let's be fair. If you're if you if you're coming home from work and you're talking to your spouse for 100, you know, 90 minutes, two hours, that's not a story. That's just venting. That's cool. Um, but when you're in a kind of context, a job interview context, for instance, it needs to stay short because it's like it should feel like a conversation. It shouldn't feel like I'm just rambling on. If that makes sense. So yes, that's exactly what I mean. Principle, principle number two. Principle number two. An illumination should be emotional i mean as you know in the in the book there's a story about my grandmother that and it's and i, I, won't, I won't give away the story but it, it has it ends in like 30 seconds and it ends with a very remarkable and spectacular moment that gives you shivers um and that's a good thing even again i'm going to use the job interview context here which is that we want to connect you know Cameron, i want you to connect to me if you were going to try to hire me vice versa and so an emotional kind of response is a good response to get to evoke in a story and an emotion can be um, uh, transferring your feeling about a particular event in your past to that other person. So it could be joy, it could be right. sadness, but it, it can also be maybe satisfaction from overcoming a challenge in your previous job. 
or in your life. That exactly too, Fred, would right? That would apply to especially a job interview. That it, it really would. And like, and, and, and when we were done with this, if you want to ask me a, a, about a short story, I can give you one that, that would uh, that is exactly an example of, of how it illuminates me and illuminates why I kind of went down the path I did in my life and the work I did. So we have time. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get through the four and then I'll tell you and then we'll, we'll go from there. Let's so, do that. Let's do that. <laughs> Third principle an illumination should start where it stops. In other words, it has to end, correct, right. Fred? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that's the first most important thing. End your story. Like if, if you realize that like you've been going on for like an hour, that is not a story. That's just like, that's a ramble. You know, it's like, and there's places for that, but just not, not, not let's say in, in the work context. But yeah, it has to end. And often for me, this is the notion, the notion that let's end at the, at the kind of cliffhanger moment. You know, I'm, I'm like writing a piece right now and I'm like, and then I, these people kind of got through this amazing thing and stay tuned for the next piece. Cause it's basically that, that's what you want. So my grandmother was really good at this. She'd end right where um, it, the story began and you knew you were going to show up to hear her story the next day. So it's like, you, you, you want that kind of like, wait, you can't, I want more. That's a, that's an important piece of it. And when you've achieved your purpose. In exactly. The story, you well, have- I mean, can I give you a little example? I mean, at IDEO for years, um, there, people were so caught up in telling the process story of how things happened. And what I realized is that when you just kept, when you got to the insight, what was the surprising insight? That's when you should stop. Like, don't tell them how it ends. Don't tell them what the product was. You know, just give them the insight and then stop. And people are like hanging on what you're saying. And finally, principle number four, an illumination should have a twist. Yeah. Well, and that's human nature. We love a twist. It's why like people love Dark Mirror and people love like, you know, O. Henry, if like, if you remember who O. Henry was or Flannery O'Connor, or it's like that little twist is what sticks it. And we always remember a twist. And so I always try to make sure that like you, you end with a twist, you know, and, and again, my grandmother was really good at this. So um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a great example. Yeah. But Fred, do you have a story that, that you've been telling that illuminates something about who you are. Yeah, I'll give you one. So as you know, one of the chapters of the book is on creative listening. And I talk about how um, my mother was an amazing listener, better, better, like people just would talk, walk up to her and like just pour their story out to her. And when I was 24, my mom had a severe debilitating stroke and she was left aphasic, um, which meant that she could no longer listen as easily. And I realized then that what had been a natural skill in her was incredibly hard work. Um, And so that did two things for me. It both taught me about how hard listening is, but it also basically set me down a path uh, to be like, get as much done as I could possibly get done in my life in as short as time as possible, because I knew I had a time limit. Short story, emotional, it has a twist and it ends. (laughs) <laughs> it has a purpose. I hope oh, but, I can kind of do it. It's like yeah. this, at this point. No, but it, it's it, it's true. I, I I think this whole you know storytelling. Uh, again, I love what how you phrase it. Illuminations is such an important skill for. Uh, I wrote an entire book on storytelling and business, and, and I I realized that very few people understand what what that means exactly. So I'm glad you really focused on illuminate who you are for your audience because that's how you connect to other people yeah no i really appreciate that and i will tell you that like a friend of mine who read it um basically was like and by the way your whole school your whole book is basically short stories with twists and like at some point she was like wait a second you actually did it through the whole book which i i don't even think i realized to be honest so fred most of the conversations we're having now are virtual and i think even in a post-pandemic world uh we're never going to go quite back to where we were before. I believe we'll still have a a very much of a hybrid world because we're social beings. um, So we are going to be together, but certainly more and more meetings and conversations are going to be done on like we are today via Zoom and other platforms. You have a chapter where you go through five keys for conversation in a virtual world. Can we go through them quickly? Yeah, not only that, it was a virtual world during the pandemic. That's something that my editor made me write in an afternoon. 
to get like, just, just to give you a sense of how that had to go. Well, yeah, I like and, it. I like it because it looks at communication virtually from design centered principles. So let's go through them. Uh, number one, the first key assess and commit or don't. <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, so the first chapter of the book is on commitment. And that's the idea that actually you, when you're going into a hard conversation, you commit first to the people in the conversation, and then you commit that you're actually going to follow through with the work to be done, right? So even in that context, often in the workplace, I'm sort of like, if you're not doing the work and you're not integral to the work, don't show up. It's okay. You know, I would say the only place where I, I have like thoughts about that is if you're the only voice of difference, then I'd rather you show up than not. Like we, we, we need you in the conversation. But it, in this case, I also feel like if you don't show up, it makes your life a little better because there's less, there's less that you're responsible for. And it might make the conversation you didn't show up for a little better as well because they can just move faster without you. So you see this a lot in boards where there's somebody who's always disagreeing and it's like, well, I'm the role of disagree. I play disagreement because it's like, I, you know, I love this institution so much. And I'm like, yeah, maybe we don't need that so much. Maybe we need some like, let's just get this done. So. I like that idea, Fred, and the fact that so many people have Zoom fatigue, and Zoom fatigue is a real thing. If we, if we don't need you in that particular virtual meeting, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, exactly. We'll keep it small. Okay, uh, the, uh, the second key for a conversation in a virtual world, break the rules, all of them. <laughs> and that, I have to be honest, is like, that, that's, there's, a, there's a chapter again in the book called Constraints, which, it, which argued that anyway, which is like, you should break the rules because the rules, the rules constrain us. Um, when I wrote that chapter, I was like, yeah, okay, this is all new. We might as well just break it off. Like, you know, it's like there's the, and so, so it was really kind of like a little bit of creative destruction and just saying, we have no idea what we're doing here. So like, let's don't be afraid to break the rules. And that's been really powerful for us. Um, my teams have gotten way far more advanced because they've just been like, yep, no, we're going to do a three hour meeting in 30 minutes and that's going to work. You know, it's just it's what we'll do. So. Excellent. I think we need to bring that to the uh, in-person world as well, through our meetings in 30 <laughs> minutes. Uh, the, the, the third key, adapt the medium to the work. What does that mean? So that means that right now, you, and you, you referenced this at the beginning, we are, we are assuming that Zoom is the best way for us to have conversations. Um, but the reality is that's not necessarily the case. Like sometimes, for instance, for you and I, sometimes we'll have a more intimate conversation if it's just you and I on the phone because phones are more confessional spaces, right? We're not seeing each other's faces. So we're willing to kind of talk about things we might not be willing to. But um, I will also say, like, think about the fact that working in a Google Doc can sometimes feel like you're in conversation with your team. You know, my editor and I work in a Google Doc and I feel like he's like, he's the same as if I'm in conversation with him and it works really well. So don't assume Zoom is basically what I'm saying. Excellent. Aim for simplicity and elegance. That's illuminations, right? So it's, it's just like, I, I don't care about eloquence. I care about simple, straightforward communication that's kind of as, as short and as concise as possible. And finally, the fifth key for conversation in a virtual world, design humans in. <laughs> isn't, <laughs> well, that so what we're, isn't that what we're doing in every meeting? It's, yeah, it's, but it's, I think that it's funny. Like if, if, we were, if I were doing a lecture right now, when you said that, my husband would show up with like a glass of wine or something. And that's done on purpose. I choreograph that because I'll be like, David, say hi to Berlin. You know, and he says like, hi to Berlin. Um, and, and that's like, a, it's purposefully to be like, hey, listen, I'm normal. I got, you know, I, I'm gonna have a glass of wine. You know, my, my husband's in the other room. That's how it is. So it's a way for us to see you. But by the way, that Very is interesting. An that's an illumination. Think about it. Like, it's like, I just, my husband shows up, brings me a glass of wine. He says, I love you, Berlin. Like, and it's this like little twist. You didn't expect it. And then I say, we designed that in and you got, it's like this little thing. So it goes back to our original principles of the 22nd little illumination. Fred, you've given me something new to think about. See, that's why I, I like, you. I, like your, I like your book. I've written a lot of books on communication <laughs> skills. When you give me something new, it's almost like you're designing the, not only the setting, but you're designing the experience. 
Mm. Totally. I mean, it's yeah. like, I want to know what's over in that corner. Like you've got some, you've got a whiteboard over there and it's like, I, I want to see it all. Like it's, like, it's yeah. you know, so that, that's the thing, you know, it's yeah. like, you kind of, you kind of want to see. The, the, that it. is a, uh, w w one of those graphics when I was giving a talk and somebody actually, you know, drew out my whole conversation as the, I love those things. <laughs> yeah, right. And suddenly it's like memorable. Like I love that notion. So I, I like just looking at that, I'm like, I, that's the reason we think about illuminations is once it sticks, it has to be memorable. So I'm sure that has to do with your storytelling thing. So excellent. I love that. Great. Uh, finally, let's talk about simplicity. Uh, the best designs are complex to make, but simple to use. How can we apply the best of design thinking and clarity and simplicity to the way we have conversations? Yeah, I mean, so this did come out of some projects I did for IDEO in the healthcare space, where we would go out, for instance, and um, talk to people who were in the emergency rooms, and they would basically say, you would ask them if they knew the word triage, and they would say, no, I don't know the word triage. And so when 50% of the people in an emergency room don't know triage, that's actually an important thing. So, but what I would say about that is, what our principles for that were, talk normal when you're talking to patients. So if you're a doctor, talk normal. But what you don't want is a doctor talking normal to another doctor. Like if you're like an expert in something, you want them to talk as fast and as expert as they possibly can because they need to get things going. It's just when it's excluding other people. So I'll bring that right to the business context. We have methods and method methodologies all over the place. And those methodologies are actually exclusionary in many cases. They, they actually don't let us into the conversation or acronyms, right? Acronyms aren't words. So how, how many times have you had to sit through meetings where you have to like ask for explanations for every single acronym that's being used? Um, so I really ask you to lose acronyms. I ask you if possible not to be too adherent to methodologies. If possible, talk normal. Like the most embarrassing thing about the book is that in that chapter on clarity, which was originally called talk normal, is that the first paragraph I used the word obfuscates and I was like, oh, wait, probably should have cut that one. <laughs> it's like so was that still in the book? Uh, it's still there. It won't be if, it, if there's a second edition, I promise you. It'll just, it'll just be like, clear, you know, like don't confuse people. Or it is <laughs> Why is it so hard to talk normal? As a communication expert and somebody who works with executives on their communication skills, uh, it, it's, it's one of the most frustrating parts of what I do. Uh, but it's also one of the most important to uh, take yeah. complexity and make it simple. But it's, it's almost like we have this own language and yeah. it's very hard for people mm -hmm. to get out of their own world and, and communicate, translate what they do to the average person. That's, that's totally right. And I, and I think it, part of it has to do is because we love expertise. We love ourselves as experts, right? So, um, I mean, you're, you're an expert on storytelling and yet you talk very normally about it. It's, it's like, you know, if, if I see the word memorable, I'm like, you're not using some brand new methodology. It's like you're using something quite simple. And so it really is about that. Sometimes, like I said, it's important that you actually kind of commu communicate in expert language. Like again, a doctor talking to a doctor, please, you know, do that. But a doctor talking to patients, don't. And last thing I'll say is don't mistake things. Again, lawyers talking to lawyers, fine. Mm -hmm. But like, don't confuse, for instance, a courtroom or a court trial as a conversation. It's not, right? It's like, it's, it's only experts talking to experts. You as the client are just, you're, you're kind of like impeded by, by the moment, basically. So I, I do think it's really about, that's, that's last thing, as an architect, that was the way that I could basically kind of, um, you know, sneak something by a client without them actually knowing what I was saying because I could actually speak in expert language, which is why I really wanted to get rid of it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a practice for me. Fred, finally, as we wrap up, I hadn't intended to ask you, but I'm curious why in your world, especially you work with government agencies, you work with so many different uh, companies from Nike to the Mayo Clinic to the Red Cross with governmental agencies, why is making conversation and, and effective communication so important today? Maybe now more than ever. Well, you know, I have a, I have a theory about that, which is that um, let's say corporate strategy is in fact a long conversation. And what I believe is um, that when 
people feel like they've been included in the conversation, they own that strategy better. And so one of the things that I really kind of, I began to recognize as I was writing the book is that if we can treat every important conversation as a conversation, then people will feel like they own it more. Um, and, that, and that's a good thing for us. That's whether, whether we're in a corporate context or whether we're in tri-sectoral context where it's like we're trying to change the world or the social, social context is that people should feel like they helped make the world happen or helped make the work happen. And that helps happens when you make conversation together. So I, I just feel like it's, it just suddenly feels like the easiest way for us to be getting moving forward right now. Excellent. And the hardest. <laughs> it is. Making yeah. conversation. Fred, thank you so much. It'll have a permanent place on, on my bookshelf. Thank you. That's, that's very kind. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Fred. No, and I look forward to reading your books now. I want them all. <laughs> You'll get Thanks them. Much. Thank you. I hope you liked that interview. For more videos every week, subscribe to Carmine Gallo TV. Together, we'll elevate your leadership and communication skills.